about myself, I have spent now 23 years in the energy industry. Um, I mean, the interesting fact about me was I was probably one of the first few employees of the National Stock Exchange in India. Uh, and uh, yeah, and um, I've been living in the US since um, 2021, uh, more or less, and been with Shell since then. So it's been uh, 23 years. I think I've I've pretty much worked across the globe, um, North America. I had a very long stint in India as well uh, recently. And then uh, back to the States since 2020, I've worked in Europe, um, Asia, Singapore, uh, and done roles across technology, strategy, and supply chain. So, and in supply chain, I've done various roles. I've built intelligence teams, managed large categories, introduced SRM, and now I'm I'm kind of doing uh, digital transformation for one of our businesses um, uh, in Lubricant. So yeah, it's been quite a journey. Uh, I have also recently started writing because people have kind of told me to to do more about sharing. So I've recently started to publish my newsletter in uh, in LinkedIn, just called yes. the Supply Chain Podcast, and I share quite a few of my thoughts on mostly supply chain topics, but also topics that are close to me in terms of um, energy sustainability right. and things like that and and also i love uh, sharing about some of the things that's happening in india as well which is yeah. very exciting in my view you know the hydrogen transformation or right. things like uh, you know the the upi uh, kind of you know uh, payments which i think is a game changer for the supply chain yeah. um, and like that so yeah i have various interests um, and it's uh, quite enjoyable to talk to um, peers and learn from them yeah, yeah. no no actually uh... Uh, I can confirm you that uh, for people like me who are still in the early uh, stage of or a middle management level or the freshers or people who want to join, uh, if insights are coming from leaders like you, it is very helpful because uh, you are putting everything you have done, all the learnings, all the challenges in a simple uh, newsletter. And for us, we don't have to go here and there. Like we can read it and we can understand, okay, this was something which was done by something, someone in the industry. And if we are doing something wrong, why not to learn from it? So I think it is thanks to you and uh, leaders like you are, who are writing on LinkedIn and publishing newsletters so that people like us can read and learn and, you know, make our daily uh, life better. Uh, professionally also, personally also, because you learn a lot of things on personal level also when you read about the journeys like uh, the leaders have gone through the same challenges. So that means they are doing very well. So there is a hope that you will also go through the phase, but you will also come out as a winner uh, from difficult yeah. situations. So I think thanks for uh, uh, doing contribution to the community and helping us to learn uh, on that. My level. pleasure. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Shri So actually, I uh, uh, I was going through the profile. Uh, you have already covered everything in the brief. Um, so actually, you have uh, already worked all across the verticals, if I'll say, in the downstream side also, on the market intelligence side also, supply chain excellence side also, now, uh, now working on the solutions part as well, uh, uh, IT part as well. Uh, so... The thing is that there is a lot to discuss. So today, uh, like I discussed with you, that the two key areas which are very important for everyone and when it, it, is, it is coming from a person who has seen the industry like more than two decades like you will be very helpful and which are basically the area of market intelligence and then the stakeholder management. And I think for you, you worked in market intelligence first and then you moved to supply chain excellence where you have to talk to and work with multiple people and it is very mm -hmm. difficult to you know onboard people and solve the challenges for the organization so i think this topic will be very helpful which we can cover today and the audience can learn from your experiences mm -hmm. and what we can do better if we are not able to do it so starting from the market intelligence point of view uh if you can help uh, us understand in understanding that why basically this area is very important for any business, specifically from the supply chain side, and what exactly happens on operational level uh, when people say that we are doing market intelligence to improve our processes or systems or whatever we are trying to do. Yeah, 
No, it's a really important uh, topic. A lot of people have asked me because it's not uh, not often that uh, you know um, supply chain gets to have their own intelligence team. Kind of like you find this mostly in in customers and in strategy. Um, I think um, companies that don't invest in market intelligence are really kind of you know missing um, uh, a very important piece that could actually transform their supply chains. So when I think about market intelligence, I think there's two things you need to keep in mind. So one is your human intelligence, right? Okay. Um, just I mean, what you get over chai and, uh, you know, yes. samosa you not get in like reading uh, volumes of journals, right? right? So one thing that I always, that one of the transformations that I try to bring about is to encourage the procurement people to talk more to their suppliers and okay. talk more to their, um, you know, attend industry conference and, you know, keep your eyes and ears open to what is going on. So that is the human intelligence. But what often, often happens is you get the human intelligence, but it's not disseminated, right? Yes. So you need you need systems to make sure that the intelligence that you're gathering is actually then, um, uh, what, what do I say, disseminated across the organization. So yes. that is one part, right? The human intelligence. So we should really encourage procurement people. So if you're early in your career and you really want to kind of develop in the profession, one of the best things you can do is to, improve your curiosity quotient right be yeah. curious about the market uh, yeah. you know understand what's happening in the industry you know talk to more people like what you're doing right i mean uh, yeah. talk to um, uh, others that talk, talk to industries that are not like you okay for example okay. if you are in energy go make an effort to talk to somebody in automotive because mostly you know you'll get so many insights from right. outside of the industry so that is one part what i call the human intelligence right okay the second piece of market intelligence is Again, if you think about it, you first need to understand what's happening in the market. Okay. And typically you can, uh, you know, your procurement spend, you can uh, dissect them into categories. Okay. And, and for the categories, you need to make sure that you establish good intelligence sources. Okay. You know, and each category is very different, right? There are specialist right. journals that, that cover certain categories and okay. um, there are, you know, broad-based intelligence sources as well. So you should make a decision because you can't invest in everything, right? I mean... Uh, so you have to make some conscious choices and that's where you have to put some effort into understanding what are the best intelligence sources for that particular category that matters. Yeah. Okay. So that's one part. The second thing that you should develop capability about is uh, cost modeling and benchmarking. Right. Okay. Um, so somebody who's just starting out in procurement, a cost model is nothing but you're building up a supplier's cost. In, in your basis. So what you're trying to say is, okay, what are my material costs? What, what could be their labor cost? What could be their profit margins? Um, and therefore you come at a cost. Because otherwise what happens is people negotiate based on, oh, I'm quoting you a hundred rupees and I'm going to get, you know, 10% off and it, it, right. it's 90. That, that's not a negotiation, right? I mean, what, but if you have the intelligence that says, hey, after building up all of this cost, maximum, even including profit margins, it's it's at 60 you know this this gap between 60 and 90 rupees can be closed yeah Correct. so that's the importance of cost modeling so to develop good cost modeling you need intelligence sources again yes. yeah because you are trying to estimate your best um estimate of what the suppliers costs and profit margins are going to be and yeah. and then you can negotiate based on facts right hey you know why are you quoting me 100 you know give me your cost build up so it's not like i'm i'm disagreeing with you i want to understand right and, and when you have this type of a negotiation, you can also kind of like understand where are the things, what are you doing that's increasing the supplier's cost and maybe some win-win outcomes can also be had. So cost modeling is a very important thing that, you know, you should have some capability to develop and there are various approaches to cost modeling. You can have clean sheets, you can do index-based cost modeling. So you, ha you have to understand for that particular category um, that you are looking into, what would be the best method to yes. come up some good cost model. So that's a part of market intelligence. The second thing is benchmarking, you know, mm -hmm. uh, because you can do all kinds of internal things, but you have to find a way to benchmark yourself, um, you know, at appropriate intervals, right? And you have to find what's the best way of benchmarking this. Sometimes you can do it yourself. Sometimes it can be through industry bodies. Um, uh, like, for example, in the energy industry, there's a agency called IPA, which, which benchmarks capital projects. And okay. from that, you can get some insights on how is procurement performing on those capital markets, right? So that's okay. that's that's the type of thing. So you have to try and understand, again, where, where again, not a broad brush that everything has to be benchmarked, but you have to understand, okay, where could I get more 
intelligence if I go out and have some benchmarking efforts. And that's a decision that, that a procurement leader has to make. Yeah. So that's that's what I would call um, um, the, the, the three layers, right? So one is understanding what are your intelligence sources. Okay. The second one is developing capability to do cost models. And the third one is, is developing capability to do benchmarks. Uh, and fundamental to, to all of that is the human intelligence piece. You know, the thing right. that you get over in Samosa, invaluable. Yeah. Yeah. Right. No, no, actually, uh, yes, I can relate to it uh, because um, out of these three, the human intelligence part is something which is very, very critical. And I think on that part, uh, I, I always have this question in mind, which I always try to ask different leaders that, uh, is it an individual's um, um, approach where some, if there is a team of six people, for example, I have seen there will be an there will be few individuals who will be very proactive in doing this. Like they are very good in making relationship with the suppliers, with the customers, with the internal stakeholders. So they are like regularly in touch. They are talking to people over chai or coffee or just having a normal chat, and they are able to get a better information. There are some people they struggle to do it. But do, so do you think that? Um, uh, there is a possibility of making it very structured in, in the organization that everyone can get a benefit by using some frameworks or something. I don't know what, uh, just curious to know uh, yeah. if that's possible. <laughs> that's an excellent question. So I myself am a diehard introvert and I find it very hard to do this networking for the sake of networking. Um, but one thing I have um, realized over the years is that you have to have um this ability to ask open ended questions okay right so uh, and this is something that everybody can develop so one is to stay curious and again that's again your mindset right um so being curious doesn't mean i go out and ask intrusive questions you know there are also things where you cannot ask questions because there are they are competently sensitive and you cannot do that right Correct. so once you understand what the rules of the game are um, there is always still things that, that you can do by staying curious, right? So it's a, it's a bit of a mindset to say that I need to explore and I need to know more. Okay. And the second thing is the ability to ask open-ended questions, right? Uh, and open-ended question just means that uh, I'm, I'm really using things like how and, and what and why and, uh, and really not trying to lead the witness in terms of, you know, the answers, you know. Uh, so this 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 thing you can actually develop. I mean, there are lots of videos on YouTube about asking uh, open-ended questions. There are a lot of books as well, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and and if you pick up any of the classic coaching books as well, you, you know you can get quite some insights on how to do this question. So it's mm -hmm. it's 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 that inquiry based um, based approach. And and once you start kind of you know having some questions in your repertoire that you want to always repeat, you know that it becomes easier. Yeah. So, right. so that's one thing that I would say is always keep an open mind um, uh, in, in, uh, and, and trying to learn because that, that's a very important part. But the second thing is the organization needs to have systems and processes to disseminate this, this intelligence. And, and these days, you know, there are lots of these forums and, you know, you can, you can create like uh, working groups and, right. um, you know, um, informal networks and, 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 and try to share what is going on, right? You should get into the discipline of, sharing what you find. Hey, you know, I was at, at this conference and I, um, I I saw a Toyota doing this in terms of their relationship management. How might that apply to us, you know? Or you see some other startup doing something and you say, oh, that, that's really interesting, you know, would that be applicable to us? Because not everything, if you have like a hundred ideas, maybe two or three could be, uh, you know, relevant for you. But if you don't have that repertoire of a hundred ideas, you won't find the two or three that that's actually a gem. Uh, for your own organization. So that's where I think staying curious and, and disseminating that back in terms of some type of network. Um, what, what I typically try to encourage is is, is, is is kind of a natural team, right? You have the procurement person, you have the, the business stakeholders, and usually you have the, the construct of the contract management teams. Make it a point to kind of share this thing and ask the supplier what's going on in their industry. Many people forget, that, right? It's a big source of innovation. You know, your, your, your supply chain is, is is probably the biggest untapped human capital that you have um, in right. the organization, you know, because they are also seeing things, right? I mean, they're also seeing the markets and they also have a view on, on what's happening. So find a way to harness that through through your conversations. Yeah. Right, right. No, no, so actually the point just you mentioned, 
um, they try to ask uh, what is happening from the stakeholders or the suppliers, for example. I remember my first manager when I had the first role in procurement. So I was also in the learning phase and um, like what you mentioned about being introvert. So I was not sure that how to understand the market very well. So my manager, she told me that Maninder, whenever you are meeting, just genuinely ask the suppliers that what is happening, uh, what good things are happening in your organization or, or with your suppliers, is market going in the right, right direction or wrong direction. So these people will be very happy to share with you because they know you are new and they have lots of knowledge. So uh, mostly people love to uh, share the knowledge to a until it is not confidential, they will be happy to let you know. So that is from where I also started. So I think, the, and this is something I tell uh, uh, other people also who reach out to me that you can start from here because this is from where I started. And then I started connecting the dots, like what you rightly mentioned about industries, conferences and startups and other companies, what they are doing, that how to connect the dots and see how the information is coming out and how we are able to harness the uh, information which is available um, in, in the value chain overall. Perfect, perfect. Um, so uh, you mentioned about the cost modeling and benchmark as well. Um, so um, you covered that there are multiple reports available which companies use as a part of this process. Uh, but we know that uh, these reports are not uh, cheap, like very costly reports, like you have to pay a lot of money so one part is that some part of it you are able to cover through the human in, uh, in, uh, human side of interactions, uh, the first thing you mentioned. But still you need to uh, get to understand, for example, um, while working for the tire industry, uh, we used to uh, read a lot about the capacities globally, that which company is adding any capacity, which company is reducing the capacity because we know the prices will move up and down. And we had certain sources, but very costly sources, like multiple thousands of dollars per year. In case there is a small company, they are not able to buy those reports. So do you think it will be easier for them to just follow the first part, interact with the supplier, read the reports, because they will not have much time also to do these things under-resourced mostly, you know. So what can they, they do? Like uh, any suggestions for such companies who are small, not able to... Uh, buy a report, but they can still do something to use the market intelligence. Absolutely. So if you think about it, right, um, um, if you're dealing with a public company, then everybody pr produces their income statements and balance sheet, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's free. So you can read the income statement and balance sheet and you kind of know the, you know, what, what are they doing in terms of raw material, labor, what are their ratios, you know, there are various ratios that are available. And, and you can apply publicly available indices. If you read the stock market, I mean, if you look at the futures market, et cetera, I mean, this is again, free information, right? I mean, you can basically see what are certain commodities doing. And right. so you can develop some index days approaches, right? Okay. I mean, not, so it it's still possible, right? And if you get to a good 80, 20, believe me, if you, if you just use free sources, okay. right? Uh, quite a lot of information is actually available in energy. I mean, if you look at the IEA or, uh, many of the other things you 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 get free information yeah and a lot can be built up so what mostly what the other sources are doing are they're trying to package it right okay. so if, if you're a small company and, and you want to start somewhere prioritize right understand that hey tire industry what do i need to know i need to know how rubber is doing yeah i need right. to know how the paper is doing in that particular area right i need to know what my overheads are in terms of logistics costs and freight costs Right. Yeah. I mean, there are a few, three big, big buckets and, and, you know, rubber futures, they're available everywhere. I mean, right. so I think, again, it may not be the hundred percent packaged information that you would get if you really went to a particular industry source. But if you look at what's available in stock markets in terms of a company's balance sheets, just by talking to people, talking to suppliers, you, you can get a lot. Yeah. I mean, Will it be hundred percent perfect? Probably not, but it's much better than going into yes. a negotiation without a cost model, right? Yeah. Right, right. Yes, yes. It makes sense, and I, I think it's very well uh, structured. Also, like yeah, what you said. Balance sheet. You get this thing called management's analysis, right? I mean, read yes. that. I mean, right. it's it's real gold in terms of what they think is going to happen, and you can kind of develop your own um, uh, estimates 
uh, based on what's there. And if you read, like, like I mean, if you're in the tire industry, you read, pick up a few, like Seat, MRF, mm. whatever, yeah, uh, Goodyear, uh, pick up four or five balance sheets and read through them. It won't take more than like uh, three hours, I guess. Right. If you really study them, and then you can get a really good estimate to to build up your cost model. Yeah. No, no, perfect, perfect. I, I think, yes, this is something which obviously, even if the firm is small, they can do it for sure. Like even if the company is not available, they can pick up the competitor and the management analysis, like very well written, you rightly mentioned. Very well written. I mean, uh, if you're dealing with a private industry, then you need to go visit, you know, yes. you need to go. I mean, I think everybody can go visit their suppliers, uh, um, you know, place of work. Right. I mean, because I think that's about staying curious and you can you can have a good feel for, you know, what is what is the quality procedures? You know, what are the types of equipments that they're having to produce your thing? You know, what, you know, what what kind of labor are they using? One, it, it, it assures yourself, especially for the big categories, right? If it really matters to you, you know, yeah. a supplier that can give you a lot of a um, lot of intelligence about um not only the suppliers costs but also kind of you know is it really meeting your standards where you want to where where you would like to be as a company yeah so i think uh, make an effort to kind of you know visit some of their manufacturing facilities okay yeah okay yeah okay oh, so so to the market intelligence only one part for example in the direct materials we know mm -hmm. that um, uh, because the contribution is very high uh, for any organization so generally in some sectors or the industries, we see that there is a specific team of market intelligence who, who supports uh, the buyer or the sourcing team. Uh, but I have seen in some industries where, for example, the indirect categories, where it is very complex and fragmented, uh, again, it becomes a point of a person who is handling the category, whether this person is very much interested to know the uh, space but then again it becomes difficult because there are so many subcategories under one category and they sometimes feel overwhelmed that how much should we understand because there are multiple categories we are handling which is it's not same like direct so are, are some is something happening in the industry this is something which i also don't know maybe uh, you are in touch with the other people also yeah. that in indirect what is happening in market intelligence space Okay, so here again, it's a question of prioritization, right? Um, uh, indirect, as you rightly said, split into many um, uh, many categories. But if you just pick up like one or two of the more important indirect categories, contract labor, for example, yeah, uh, everybody would like to understand that, and 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 several labor reports are available. Like in the United States, you get you get the BLS reports, right? Which then are then packaged again into other types of reports, you know. So um, uh, there are still proxies available even for indirects okay. that you can you can make some good assumptions. But then you have to understand what is the proportion, right? I mean, how material is it, you know? Okay. Uh, and is there um, is there certain indirects that you would love, like to invest more time on um, versus you know going at your direct? So I think that that's where I said you know you have to kind of prioritize. But uh, there may be one or two indirects that are really material to you, and then you invest the time to get the market intelligence for that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and um, yeah, but but typically, if you can look at labor, even payscale.com and those sorts of things give you uh, good reports. Um, yeah, and again, you have to decide is it worth your spend versus the value that you get um, investing in those sources, yes or no. Or you look at some. Usually, the government bureaus of uh, statistics and things like that actually produce some really good reports. Mm -hmm. The problem with them is they are voluminous and um, you know not very easy to read, right? But mm -hmm. still, if it's a category that's important to you, I think you can make an effort to to kind of you know go through that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, an indirect prioritization will help to make things really easy. prioritize. Prioritize. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense also because, uh, like you rightly mentioned, labor is a very critical area where. I think uh, I also know that the people who are handling, uh, who I know that they are also referring to multiple reports because it is the and prime. Yeah. And, and labor is also a fairly, um, what would I say, I won't say easy, but but it's something that you can actually do good market intent. So for example, right, you are getting labor from a contract company for whatever, let's just, I'm just going to take engineering talent. Yeah. Um, so you 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 are getting some engineering services 
from an engineering service provider, right? You sort of know which colleges they're hiring from, okay. right? Are you getting a three-year experience company? Yeah, okay. uh, three-year experience person, five-year experience person. I'm hiring from IITs, I'm hiring from tier two, tier three, whatever, right? So let's just say that your, your provider is hiring from a tier two type of college. So you know what, what kind of salaries that they're offering. Okay. So if they are for an entry level fresher or or something three years in, in, in the market. So you can kind of estimate what their cost is going to be if you just take the base salaries and add some SGNA and, and things. So you you right. you can kind of get to a number, yeah. It's not very difficult to do. So then when you're getting quoted a number, you can you can kind of you know compare that against what you think is happening mm -hmm. um in, in this particular thing, yeah. Uh, and, and also a lot of labor indices are available, at, but but for us, you know, in energy, we deal with very specialist labor, right? So yeah. um, they have to have certain licenses. I mean, if you want to like work with, with welding or, um, you know, any um, process safety critical things, then you have to have certain certifications. So you can build up the cost for all of that, right? So this is a very specialized category. It's in short supply. No, this is a generic category. It's pretty much a commodity. I can get any man. I yeah. think you can still form estimates based on your understanding. Yeah, this is where I think staying a bit curious and understanding your your supplier's business is really important. So, how are they actually constructing this particular service? So, in, in services, it's still possible. Yeah, um, mm. even in India, um, yeah. to to kind of you know come up uh, with 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 some good estimates without a lot of effort. I believe. Yeah. Yes, yes, I agree. I agree because uh, some part of the services, for example, uh, rightly mentioned by you. Uh, that we can easily pick some points and make a base model and then start building up on it. And these informations are something maybe for the first time you might need some efforts, but then slowly, slowly uh, you can get used to the reports and the publications and then make your model very good and accurate time by time and uh, uh, come out with a good model of understanding whether you are placing your costing at a right uh, at fair pricing or not, as per the industry standards. Absolutely. Yeah. And then you keep refining the models, right? I mean, no model is perfect once it's made, but once you use it in a couple of negotiations, you are, you actually start seeing where you need to improve, you know, and yeah. make the effort. Again, prioritize, right? I mean, it's it's no point in just building cost models out of the wazoo for everything. First of all, it requires a lot of time and effort. But if you have a particularly large negotiation coming up and, you know, it's it's important to you and if it's a it's a, if it's a cost element where you need to get some savings because you need money to spend somewhere else, there are various reasons where you might want to invest a um, little bit more um, time in, in building up this understanding. Yeah. Correct. Correct. I agree. Totally agree on this part. Uh, so coming to the second part of the discussion, um, in the order of you change your role also, uh, after market intelligence, you move to a supply chain excellence role. And that is where the stakeholder management part also comes into picture and I was um, when I was reading about your profile and the uh, uh, value addition you have done in different roles I read one very interesting um, uh, point which you have mentioned in your description also of the role that you brought transparency in the system and you mentioned about service also you have done multiple surveys and then you did some joint, uh, I think, uh, uh, projects where you brought about, like converted multiple projects also, uh, further adding value to uh, the business. I, I found it very interesting. And I think that one statement, I think, will cover majority of the stakeholder management discussion also, because I'm sure you must have gone through that phase of convincing the stakeholders, then going back and forth, and then still coming out with a common consensus that this is something which will add value to the organization. And um, even though uh, somewhere linked to the first question, uh, first part of the discussion where we discussed about some people being curious and going out and trying to talk to people, I think uh, the same set of people are still able to do better relatively in terms of stakeholder management, but when it comes to people who are introvert or uh, who thinks a lot multiple times that how we should do this to ensure that everything everyone is okay. And sometimes you have to take a hard decision, so it becomes difficult. So maybe we can elaborate on that part. Uh, what happened? What type of 
case studies you draw and basically on the challenges part like what happened what, what stakeholders said and how you nav- navigated those situations maybe we can use that experience yeah. yeah no but yeah stakeholder management is i think critical throughout your career but i think um, particularly what you're referring to is my role in um, in institutionalizing supply relationship management yes. um and a lot of times you know supplier relationship management is kind of um construed as uh, contract management and that's not the case yeah mm-hmm. when you are managing a contract you you're specifically looking at that contract's performance and making sure that you know all the del- deliveries according to your safety quality cost so on and so forth but but a relationship is something different yeah uh, what i mean by that is um the the, the philosophy that um, that i try to advocate is within your supply chain i mean we have thousands of suppliers i think we have more than 40000 suppliers there are a particular few where you want to go way beyond yeah and why is that because these are suppliers that are really critical to your success right um because they are they are very well aligned with your strategy they are a source of innovation um when you grow you really need them to also perform so you invest the time and energy in kind of making these relationships better right so then you get a multiple stakeholders so one is the stakeholders within the suppliers organization there's your own internal stakeholders yes. right and those those can come from various parts it could be the businesses it could be the sustainability teams um you know product development teams yes. um customers as well because many suppliers also end up to be customers so your your marketing teams are also involved so how do you construct this this good win win relationships with these select few suppliers yeah and and when you invest the time and energy remember it it's it's all the way from the top as well right i mean uh, all the way from your very senior levels maybe sometimes even the ceo themselves may be involved in certain relationships if it's that material yeah so mm-hmm. so that's what you really mean by um supply relationship management it's it's it, it's really looking through this relationship as something that goes beyond the contract yeah mm-hmm. and you're really investing in it from the long term um because you know this is uh this is something where um um you expect that you grow your business and and the supplier is a big part of that they have skin in the game and kind of your growth yeah mm-hmm. and 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 equally the the supplier must see you as a strategic customer you know i always tell people hey we see the supplier as a strategic supplier but if if they in the in the in the krajik model look at us as a um as a as a dog or a or a cash cow then they are not going to invest the time in in this mm-hmm. relationship right mm-hmm. so you also have to have a good understanding of is the supplier is also seeing you in that way and that only comes with experience right talking to a lot of people and 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 kind of you know understanding that so that's 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 my construct of supplier man, uh, relationship management is constructing um a set of relationships um which can, can be a handful um it can be 10 you know it can be 15 you know it depends on what you think but but these are really deep relationships that mm-hmm. go well beyond kind of the current contract for the long term so the the most important thing in stakeholder management is understanding the stakeholders perspective right, right. so oh, and again this is where the same technique i mentioned of asking open ended questions and staying curious also is very important right so even for internal stakeholders right i mean procurement teams are often at the receiving end they're like okay you know i have a very good idea of what i want to do and you procurement you need to go execute this right that's sometimes the mindset you deal with right, right. so procurement to be seen as a strategic partner you need good stakeholder relationships internally in in your group and you can only do that by staying curious about the business so this yeah. is again where human needs to come out of this procurement box and try and understand what how our own internal business performs you know what are our challenges what are the things that we care about so that you know your your supply chain decisions can can manage your can merge your strategy and secondly in terms of the suppliers it's exactly the same thing right and try and have a very good understanding of the suppliers business and then um what i developed was a process i called it the value realization process okay where you know you have certain really important relationships but then there's a bit of blood blood or people don't really understand each other okay. so it's a very structured process where i first do um surveys right so um sometimes in some large relationships it can be up to 50 in each side you know okay. uh, from your side as well as the supplier side but because you are trying to be um like an independent third party or or a very neutral kind of a team that that looks at this 
like take a step back and understand what's happening, right? So out of those surveys, you get start to get some trends, right? Uh, what are the pitfalls in this relationship? Maybe there's lack of trust. Maybe we don't communicate properly. Okay. Uh, or maybe the fact that we perceive that um, the quality deliverability is poor and, and they believe that it's it's poor because of something that we've done, you know? So it could be all kinds of things. But when you really do these kind of surveys, you get you get some good information. The second step is to go to interviews. So select some of those and, and, and kind of, again, come at it from a neutral perspective to say, hey, I'm here to really look at this relationship. So could you please tell me what's happening behind the scenes, you know? Okay. Um, and, 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 and by the way, keep those interviews anonymous because people don't want to maybe have their names um, right. against what they said. Sometimes they're okay, sometimes they're not okay, but, but offer to keep it anonymous and try and get behind what's happening so that you get even more data. And out of that, I think you can start to construct um, what could be some, some value opportunities that's really win-win. And then, yeah. then what I typically try to do is take them into a workshop. Maybe it's a day, maybe it's two days where you get the senior management of mm -hmm. both sides. And okay. then you, you present the results in an objective manner of what has been found. But then you've also done some homework on, okay, so these are the issues, but there are also opportunities. And, and what would be a good set of uh, value opportunities that you can get if you reset this on... Yeah. Sometimes it may not even be the fact that it's it's a troubled relationship. It can be a well-functioning relationship, but you want to take it to the next okay. step. And Correct. therefore, you start with an objective of where do you get these opportunities. You go through a structured process to kind of rank them. Okay. And 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 and, and do some assessment against, okay, th these are the opportunities and this could be the value that okay. you get out of it. Um, this could It's going to take this many resources. Are we ready to commit? And then it gets constructed into like a like a funnel. We call it the joint improvement uh, program. You know, okay. so then both the suppliers um, and your company has a has a stake in it, and you keep monitoring it. Now the important thing is you've done all this work, but sometimes it gets put at the Godrej Almeida, as I call it, right? I mean that's don't do that because then you lose the trust, right? right? I mean lose the trust between the supplier. The supplier is like, oh, I did all this good work, but then none of my ideas are being implemented, you know? Right. So that's not good. And with your own internal stakeholder, you, you'd come into the fact that, hey, you know, all this work happened. What's the result? So you have to find a way to keep the momentum going on those improvement right. opportunities. Hard, but as long as you keep a cadence of communicating what's happening on those um, on those activities and, and kind of, you know, making sure that that's um, followed through. And sometimes some ideas may need to be dropped, but be very transparent about it. Hey, we thought this was a good idea during the workshop, but We've since done some in, some um, deeper analysis. We think that's not feasible. Could right. we agree to drop this? Or you, you could say that, hey, as we worked on it, some more, um, even better ideas have come up. So it's something where you apply that agile methodology, right? I mean, as right. you learn from agile, keep kind of, you know, working it. And then you can really start to see some, see some good results. But it's kind of making an environment where your supplier has skin in the game and your success and equally you have a skin in the game and their success. Yeah. Right. right. So uh, when you were saying about uh, the surveys and uh, taking the inputs um, anonymously, so uh, like uh, generally it would be better that the, for example, if procurement is doing it or maybe the some other vertical of supply chain who wants the information actually, they are doing it so they should be driving it by themselves or uh, it's okay to uh, have a third party who does the uh, activities on our behalf what uh, i'm feeling is that yeah, if, yeah, yeah, yeah. i understand where you're going so um we also debated this quite a bit i mean there are a lot of consultancies that actually do this kind of work okay we decided to do it internally because you have to develop the entire internal muscle to do this you know because okay. supplier relationship management and understanding how to build relationships is, I think, very fundamental. Because think about it, right? These days, the supply chains have become very complex. And right. and I keep, I think I've spoken about this in several forums as well. The depth of your relationships is the number one guarantee for your resilience, hmm. right? Because imagine there's a big disruption in the supply chain. You know, there is an allocation everywhere, right? Hmm. Um, and you want to be front on that list uh, where your supplier possibly says hey this is a relationship i value i i thought i had 100 units but now i'm only going to have 25 mm -hmm. and of that 25 i want to try and make sure that I, I fulfill your demand um as much as i can to come to that level it takes 
you know, good relationship management. And if you if you even look at the COVID and the other um, disruptions, the companies that actually performed well were the ones that actually invested very deeply in supplier relationships. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this, in my humble view, is an internal muscle that okay. you should develop. Uh, and and the capability to do relationship management. Sometimes you can you can appoint um, relationship managers. That's part of somebody's job. In some cases, you may decide that you need a dedicated relationship manager. That's all. That all depends on the nature of your business and how much money you have um, to develop. So it's not a one size fits all. So you have to assess yourself. But I would argue that for your most relevant relationships and this is not just spend right yeah. i mean the segmentation has to go beyond spend so just because you spend a lot of money with the supplier may not be that you know that's the supplier you want to invest a lot of time in relationship management it, it could be a commoditized supplier where you are still okay doing three bids in a buy so you yeah. have to do some really good internal analysis to understand which are the relationships which i want to perform i want to take to the next level and then you need to be investing time to make that happen um, mm -hmm. but, but in my humble view, um, these sorts of things, it will be good for companies to invest the muscle to do that themselves. Yeah. Correct. And while you were saying this, I, I already have an idea that what I can do using this information um, uh, in my part of the area, uh, uh, which might be very interesting to do. Because... Um, Generally, what I have seen, uh, I'm not sure, maybe um, you must have seen the other side also that, um, again, coming to the those areas which are very crucial for the business, I have seen that everyone is very involved in making such initiatives a success. The moment uh, you have to focus on, a, on an area which is not a big contributor, but it is kind of an area which cannot be ignored so sometimes it becomes very difficult to take a buy-in from multiple stakeholders also to drive such an initiative which you rightly mentioned also that it takes a lot of energy also uh, so, but i think at the same point if something of the same sort can be done from though for those areas which are mostly neglected in any organization maybe something can come out in terms of better relationship better savings resilience of the supply chain so i i was thinking on those lines if something can be tried for those areas yeah. as well which are not explored um, yeah especially if there's value hidden in those you know right sometimes you have a suspicion hey this this, this area is neglected and, and if i did something about it maybe i i, I reap a lot of value you know so Correct. you always have to have a value-based conversation. So that's important, right? You, there, there should be no hobby horsing that, hey, I want to do an SRM program and I, I want to do this kind of value analysis. I mean, everybody is busy, right? I mean, uh, so it would be very difficult to, to sell anything like this to your stakeholders if if there is not a good value case, right? right. And, and, and the value case has to be constructed along the lines that of how it's supporting the business strategy. Are you seeking more innovation? Are you seeking better resilience? Are you seeking resolution of quality issues? Um, is it cost that you want to get after? You know, right. you, you have to have a good idea of what are the parameters that you want to drive um, as a result of these kind of initiatives because they do take a lot of time. But at the same time, I also believe that they can be simplified and applied in many contexts. Because mm. if you remember the whole, the, the fundamental belief of this is the fact that I'm going to understand my supplier in much more depth, right? Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe it doesn't take 50 surveys and, and, and interviews and then workshops. Maybe it can be done as a part of the contract management process. Right. Because I've also creatively scaled this in other areas as well. You know, it doesn't have to be such a big and involved process. At the same time, some areas, because you're spending billions of dollars, right. um, you do need such a, such a construct. So it's a bit of horses for courses, but the fundamental idea is that you develop a, a strong win-win uh, capabilities with, yeah. with the subset of your suppliers who matter. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yes, I agree on that part. Correct. Um, one one practical um, issue which we generally face, uh, I just want to know that how we can manage those situations. Um, and I have personally also seen those situations multiple times and I'm sure that there would be lots of people 
trying to navigate through those situations. So generally what happens is that when we try to drive something very big within any organization, which we know that will uh, bring value uh, and it is, it's not an easy journey. We need to change lots of processes. There is a lot of change management involved, new ways of working involved. And sometimes our internal stakeholders who are in the system from a longer period of time, they have some opinions maybe because of their own experiences or maybe without any uh, 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 base uh, of what they want to share in terms of the inputs. In either of the cases, it, it becomes very difficult sometimes to drive such initiatives uh, because one of the people who is saying that this will not work does not have uh, a proper reason for that. But he or she is at a position which cannot be ignored, maybe a senior person with the same organization for maybe more than 10, 20 years. And then because of the internal stakeholder management problem, there is a delay and we lose out on the opportunities. And this can be this situation can be put in a different scenarios, maybe for supply chain people also, planning people also, procurement people also. So so how generally we navigate through such situations because i know that sometimes people say that uh, you put everything on paper try to tell them the value but even after that sometimes people don't agree no no we cannot do that you do it for others i don't want this for me so generally can we navigate through situations like i'm really interested to know yeah. how to I, the, the, I mean this is a classic right everybody faces this you know um yeah. This is why in change management, when you have a large sales change, you always look for the people who are the change agents and the thought, thought leaders, right? So typically, when you want to drive change initiatives, like one of the initiatives I wanted to drive is, I mean, actually, throughout my careers, all of these initiatives are all big enterprise change platforms. So one of the things that I have really learned is um, you have to find a way to start small and scale, right? If you want to do something throughout your company, you know, if there are 10 stakeholders, there might be three who are really enthusiastic, right? So, mm -hmm. so start with the people that, that start with the areas that, that show the enthusiasm and show some successes and make sure to tell other people how successful you are. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so for example, I don't know if in your company, you have like these Yammer forums or whatever mm -hmm. it is, you know, make, make sure to shout from the rooftops when you've achieved success, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and, and ask them to tell their friends because Believe me, good news travels fast. By me, bad news travels, but good news also travels. Because mm -hmm. everybody's dealing with the same things, right? Everybody's dealing with cost pressures. They all want good quality. And fundamentally, mm -hmm. I think everybody wants the same things, right? When somebody is resisting a change, then there could be several reasons for that, right? One is they simply don't have the capacity in their organization to take the change. Secondly, they may not believe in this type of a change either, you know? Mm -hmm. So you have to find kind of, you know, who are your change agents? And who would be the silent supporters, which I would call the second level. And then the third level would be the people who are completely resistant. But by the time you go through your, your first layer and the second layer, they have already heard the new good news and nobody wants to be left out. And it helps you to refine your thinking on how do you approach that, uh, that stakeholder as well. Now, mm -hmm. if you have only one initiative and you absolutely need the buy-in of this stakeholder, then you have to find a way to convince how what you're doing resonates with their problems. Mm, okay. sometimes you know you go to the table and say i want to do this because this is a nice thing to do and they were like really you know why yeah yeah so you have to find a way to link what you're doing to to that stakeholder's purpose or the challenges that they're dealing with okay right okay. Uh, so that's that's how you you sell it because it's a classic what's in it for me right and right. this really happens when you have central initiatives that are being driven, which this, the business says is no value to me, you know, Correct. And, and, and you have to find a way to understand how is it that what you're doing adds value to them, you know, similar to customer marketing, right? Why would, why would some, some customer buy your product? Mm -hmm. Because you've communicated your product as something that adds value to them, right? Otherwise, you're not going to get any customer sale. So similarly, right, with, with internal stakeholders as well, treat them as your customer. 
what is the thing that you're doing that adds value to them and find a way to communicate that properly. It's not all about spreadsheets and PowerPoints and, and all of those things. It's really about understanding what's going on in, in their business and is, is what you're doing applicable at this time. And sometimes it's good to back off, yeah. Um, if there's a lot going on, you know, if they're already going through some type of a crisis and you come in here with a central initiative, that may not be the best time, yeah. So, okay. so you have to kind of read the room uh, and, and 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 understand how to navigate your way through that. Yeah. Yeah, actually, I think this uh, you have beautifully put uh, this customer part that yes, we we consider them as internal customer, but yes, if you have to sell your product, so how you will convince your customer? That how my product is solving their problem, why they yeah. should buy my product, why their life will be better than yesterday if they buy my product. So I think it's, it's a very good perspective. Yeah, I never tried to link th this both, but yes, that's it's, how I look at it, and they're all my customers. So yeah, but, I mean, it's kind of what I tell my department: why should we exist, right? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's, it's easy to explain also this part to anyone. Yeah, you have to find a way to, to okay, why why should the company pay my salary, right? So how is what I'm doing delivering value? I mean, if you're not delivering value, you have to be ruthless about cutting it off, yeah? I mean, one of the first things I did in my market intelligence job is I just just, just cut like 80% of the work that we're doing. Okay. I was like, nobody's asking for this stuff, right? I mean, nobody's reading these reports. They don't see value. Yeah, I, I kind of took the approach that I'm just going to cut it and see who screams. Yeah, then I know who's using it. Otherwise, cut. You know, but but then you refocus the team on things that really add value, yes. like like cost models or or targeted intelligence or things like that, which which your customers actually tell you, hey, I don't have the capability in my procurement team to do all of these things, but I would really appreciate if your market intelligence team gave me this input for this negotiation. They yes. see value and then they want to pull more. You know. They want they right. want more of it once you see that you've made a difference. Yeah. Correct. Correct. Perfect. So um we have summed up both the uh, parts, intelligence and uh, stakeholder management via the supplier relationship management route very well. Uh I'm now coming to the last part, and which I basically ask every leader that if someone who is watching watching this episode and this person is a fresher or someone who wants to make a career in supply chain, specifically in this area, uh, market intelligence or how to do well uh, when you are into a role where, where stakeholder management plays a very critical role. So uh, which skills are very critical to be developed? Some of which we have already covered, like having a curious mind, learning attitude, opening yourself to new ideas, connecting the dots. Anything else you feel that he or she, whoever wants to do this, should be focusing on maybe developing these skills to do well in this area? Yeah. So, um, so one hard skill you really need to develop is 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 developing a good understanding of businesses, and and I as I said, I think reading balance sheets is the best way to to develop okay. understanding of businesses. You know. Okay. Uh, because there's there's a lot in those things, right? I mean, um, or even listening to conference calls, you, you know, I, I'm I'm not sure how they do that in India these days, but here you get like analyst recordings, you know, when 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 the companies present, um, you know, their their uh, if if it's a listed company, if it's not, then it's something different. So so find a way to to really start deeply understanding businesses. Okay. Um, like when supplier visits, going on the ground, these kind of things are really important to not just market intelligence, but any supply chain professional, right? You have to understand what's happening in and around you. Yeah, I think that's a fundamental hard skill uh, that you have to develop. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, a soft skill is, um, is empathy. Yeah. Okay. Put yourself at the other person's shoes and try to think what they're thinking, you know? I think it, empathy really works in personal relationships. It also works in business relationships. Yes. Because then you'll start to understand when people take certain positions, what's the reason why they're doing that? You know, try to kind of uh, put yourself in that other person's shoes and try to understand what they're doing. So that's a fundamental skill in, in stakeholder management. Yeah. Okay. And, and the other thing is like trust, you know. 
Mm-hmm. When you say that you're going to do something, you better deliver, right? Otherwise, don't don't say that. I mean, it's no good saying, um, "Oh, um, we're going to build the moon," and and it never happens. You know, the 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 number one trust breaker is not following up on what you said that you would do. So develop a habit of always sticking to uh, your commitments, especially as it comes to supplier relationships, because I think actions always speak louder than words. Yeah. So right. you have to find a way to 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 be that um, to to build trust. Yeah. Yes, yeah. right. right. Uh, yeah. In fact, in fact, I think in the empathy part is something. So SRM is my favorite topic because that is where I feel that if if I have this part sorted for my organization, so I can do anything. Like I'm the king because if I have suppliers with me, they will be ready to support. And you rightly mentioned that is somewhere. Uh, that will happen only if trust will come into picture along with empathy. So I have to blend both and then uh, represent them very well in the organization and then make sure my organization's objectives are put in place in front of them. And obviously the hard skill you mentioned, the business understanding needs to be there to me. Play a their own business included, yeah. But let's not forget our own. I mean, I, I find procurement people that have never visited the plant that they're supporting. I was like, that is failure straight away because you don't yeah. understand you know kind of what's happening so you have to make a way i mean business understanding both your own business your business strategy and yeah. you know your, your supplier's business yeah correct correct no no thank you thanks a lot thank you very much i think uh, very well summarized this skill part because i feel that um, it's important to understand because sometimes you know that what is required to be done but then the primary uh, area where you need to focus is skill development. Because if you are not focusing on that part, you are not able to do anything. Because even if you have everything on plate, if you don't know how to hold your fork and spoon, you can't do anything, right? So this is something which plays a very critical role. And thanks a lot for uh, summarizing everything in a very structured framework, which is which which is going to be very easy to understand for everyone who will watch the episode. Really and- good. Thank you for um, giving me the opportunity to, to share my thinking. And like I said, I'm, I'm uh, you know, one of the things that's really important to me is is sharing what 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 your experiences are. Who knows, you know, somebody is, can right. gain from that experience. So really happy to be uh, sharing my thoughts. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks and a lot. Thank you to your audience as well. Yeah. 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 Thank you.